We're here for the final session. Now that you've learned so much about what it means to teach IDEA, how do you get started? What are next steps? We're here to give you some pointers and answer your questions so you can return to your campuses and institutions confident that you have the tools needed to successfully launch IDEA. We have some session objectives. We want you to be able to identify key differences between IDEA models so that you understand your options for how to implement IDEA. List key steps in preparation to launch IDEA so you can be secure in how you are moving forward. Understand how to access Canvas Commons and import modules so that the technology piece runs smooth. And discover available training opportunities for additional support. So we want to chat for just a moment about making a culture shift. Once the development plan was in place and the funding secured, that's when the real work began. The toughest part was making that culture shift with both faculty and students so that the more learning was done online and that students were able to do the pre-work required for implementing the flipped classroom model of instruction. It meant that, of course, there were faculty who were not used to working with the online tools or teaching online for that matter. And then we at the State Board uh, noticing that we also had not really been offering that kind of targeted training for faculty in the use of technology in the classroom and for teaching online. So the culture shift really began to happen as faculty learned what it really meant to teach in a flipped classroom model. And they learned and honed their own technology and online teaching skills, saw their students' passion for technology, and then saw the increase in outcomes that we discussed in our day one morning session. Ultimately, this increase in outcomes means more money coming back to the college. Another concern was around technology support in the classroom. Many faculty had never taught in the flipped classroom model. They didn't have the skills needed to solve technology challenges and really help students with the basics. So in the grant development, we funded and required each program to hire a technology coach. The coaches were used heavily in the beginning and were used much less as faculty became more familiar with teaching in the flipped classroom model. Now the tech coach piece in many cases has been taken over by the English language acquisition instructor, or they have a tech coach such as a student work study, an intern in IT, a volunteer, IT staff, librarians, and that tech coach can just be available at key times, such as the first week of the term, when a new student arrives through open enrollment, etc. So I'm going to take a minute and go over the idea models. Again, if you're in Washington, you're following this very prescriptively as far as data entry and marking. If you're from another state, just to clarify, this is what we have found works in Washington and what we require providers to do in Washington. It is open when it gets to your state. You know, there might be some wiggle room, but if you're in Washington, these are your options and there is no wiggle room. So, um, oops, yeah, sorry. Um, first thing, figure out whether you want to offer full or tailored idea. Again, the pilot that we described yesterday, everything was describing full idea. For the first three years, everyone in Washington offered full idea. It was post pilot that we have the options now of tailored or full idea. When you're deciding, think about the number of hours a week your classes are going to meet, how your students or are going to access the technology. Are they going to be responsible for having their own devices? Are you providing devices to check out? Do you need to have multiple sections of students sharing a computer? That will really impact how you're um, going to decide to start the program. Is there anything else on your campus or at your agency that is required that, that students do? For example, is there a service learning component? Do students have other maybe job search things if you're more at a work source, et cetera? 
what other things might you need to fit in. And then also in Washington, um, programs earn FTEs, which brings money back to the program. So if you're FTE based, you know, and you are a perf getting performance based funding or FTE based funding, obviously the more hours you offer, the more FTEs you're going to generate. If you're not FTE based, then this might be a moot point for you. So again, just quickly, full idea in Washington is either 14 to 18 hours a week. Students are completing 50% of their work online, either at a distance or as part of a web enhanced class. And all of the pre-work is housed in Canvas. Things to keep in mind with the pre-work. If you are doing a hybrid course, that means that the work needs to be completed at a distance. There has to be separation between the student and instructor. If you're counting the distance hours, we'll go through a little bit later in the presentation on how we can calculate hours for federal reporting. But the key element is that there has to be separation between the teacher and the student. Or if you're doing a web enhanced class, then you're just counting seat time and the instructor can be in the room leading students and helping students through those activities. Either way is acceptable, but if you're offering a fully flipped class, you need to keep in mind that there has to be that separation. So in Washington for full idea, originally in the pilot, it was 10 modules a quarter. Being that we've backed the hours down to 14 credits minimum for full idea, we did say eight plus modules. That way, if a provider is doing 14 credits, they can do eight modules versus the 10 modules. We also require that 80% or more of a participant's instruction and idea comes from the idea modules. Again, that's to leave a little wiggle room for anything else that might need to occur on campuses. However, we're finding that most of the instructors are still doing 100% of instruction from IDEA, but we did back that down a little bit to leave a little of that wiggle room. If you need to go back and you need to explain this to someone who was not here or just a quick sh chart to share, this chart just on time spent and full IDEA really outlines the e-learning portion and what's done online and then the face-to-face -face portion and what is done uh, in the face-to-face -face classroom as a quick overview if you need to share this with someone. And you have access to the slideshow in the Getting Started module in the Canvas training course. Uh, before I move on to Tailored Idea, did anyone have any questions or anything that um, you might have? Mm -hmm. Judy? Mm -hmm. Yes. Anyone else? Okay, so then tailored idea, a lot of this is very similar to what I just said about full idea. It can be online, flipped, or web enhanced. In this case though, the participants, rather than 14 to 18 hours of instruction, and we do have some providers here in Washington who are doing 20 hours of instruction. Um, the minimum is 10 hours, and that's what we kind of found to be the sweet spot for a tailored idea. We don't, we, it's not to say that programs cannot do it, but for marking and data reporting purposes, idea must be at least 10 credit hours here in Washington. And again, um, use both the face-to-face -face and online components of the curriculum. Again, <clears throat> not to beat a dead horse or sound like a broken record, but Please keep in mind, if you are flipping a tailored idea class, the same requirements. So if the students are completing work online, there needs to be that separation between teacher and student if you're doing a fully flipped model. If you are doing the web enhanced model, then the instructor is just in the classroom working with the students. And so what we do here in Washington is four to five modules per quarter for tailored idea as opposed to the eight plus 
And that's because you're offering less credits, maybe meeting less hours a week. So a module might take two weeks versus one week in an 18 credit class. And again, the 80% requirement to leave a little wiggle room if other things need to be brought in that are required based on a, a campus or at an agency. And we also have the same chart. So with this chart, it is the same as the full idea, except it's a side-by-side -side comparison of tailored idea, how many hours are spent online in a fl flipped class, and how many hours are spent face-to-face, -face, and what activities take place in both, if you need th to explain that. And again, if it was web enhanced, everything would just be combined into a face-to-face -face class. Um, any questions about tailored idea? Okay, well. All right, that is a lot of information. Turn to your neighbor and discuss for five minutes, which model of idea would be best for your program and why? All right, folks, let's come back together and I'd like to see a quick show of hands. Raise your hand if you think that full idea is the best fit for your program. Okay, I think I saw one hand for full idea. Raise your hand if tailored idea is the best fit for your program. Okay. All the other hands. If you had everything you needed, raise your hand if full idea would be the best fit for your program. Okay, we've gone up to seven or eight hands. Great. Thank you. Okay, folks, let's go ahead and transition over to our second objective, which is key steps in implementation. Okay, so, and we went over this a little bit in the director's session yesterday, but just if you're here without a director and you have to go back and report in, one thing to keep in mind is who's going to teach this? And so this is our best advice for who should teach the class. Someone who thinks that students can learn online. It does not mean, you know, they're 100% convinced, but they think it can be done, so they're open-minded and not, no, this is too hard because we won't get very far. Someone who's willing to try something new and who's willing to put down the textbook and the Azar book and other things that we've done for years in ESL, um, be familiar with or willing to learn about technology. It does not mean that you need to be an expert. When I moved up to Washington, I had never taught in an LMS or worked in an LMS. I got the same crash course that the faculty got in using Canvas and learned how to do it also. So you don't have to be an expert. You just have to be willing to put some time into training and be willing to give it a try. Um, Again, some experience with teaching online, it could be web enhanced, it could be just using technology in the class you're already teaching, but again, some familiarity with an online environment. Um, if you have a learning management system, again, get the training. Most campuses or e-learning departments are willing 
hopefully to do the training in Washington. Our e-learning office at SBCTC and the campus e-learning departments are great and provide the training that is needed. And somebody who's willing to be a catalyst for change, so willing to try it, they're willing to give feedback on it, they'll do it a couple times, they might find out it works, and then go present and talk to others about it and kind of keep the ball rolling that, you know, hey, we can do something different and it is going to work. Um, to give you a story, one of the campuses presented at a board of trustees meeting uh, about one quarter into the pilot, shot some video students, did a quick 10 slide PowerPoint and the question came out, well, why aren't you doing this with all of your classes? It's like, well, we don't have technology in all of our classes. Well. They ended up with computer on wheels carts for their whole basic skills program, so they were able to convert all of their low-level ESL to IDEA and also have those to use with their ABE students as well. So, you know, somebody who's willing to get out and talk about it and, you know, show what the program can do, you'd be amazed at what might returns might come back here. And also, someone who realizes that the first couple times out, you need to spend a little bit more time preparing. And that, you know, it's not something, even though we have instructional guides, there's a little bit more prep time. There are some things you need to do. The more you do it, the easier it will become. But who understands that this is a time investment, as everyone learns, yourself and the students. Speaking of students, <laughs> so who should take IDEA? Again, students should be open-minded if you're going, you know, and we can usually convince students to try something new, but we might run across one or two students who come in, you know, I'm not touching a computer and where's my grammar book? Um, it's kind of up to the instructor then to sell the program. But let the students know what they're getting into, that this is an online classroom, and have Ask them to be a little open-minded. Again, some familiarity with technology. They do not need to be a tech whiz to do this. We've all done this with level one students, and you, some don't know how to turn on a computer, and others might know more about technology than I do, but in their own language. Um, and a little com basic, basic command of English. They do not need to be fluent to do this, but some English. We generally say a student with low tech skills and low English, maybe do something else first to kind of onboard them into the class. It's not to say that it wouldn't work, but you'd probably want to have more hands on deck or volunteers who could help work with if you had a very low group you were going to pilot this with. And most students do have technology background because they use smartphones. If they don't have a tablet or a computer at home, most understand Wi-Fi and how to navigate on a smartphone, so that's a good step. Speaking of technology, so we recommend that we use laptops, partially because the keyboarding skills as opposed to touch typing on a screen. That is not to say that this cannot be offered using a tablet or a phone. The Canvas apps work just fine. You will lose the recording functionality and I believe that may have come up in some of your sessions. So there are some features that the Canvas apps don't have. It works fine on a tablet. Only the difference is you don't have the keyboards and the screens are smaller. When we started the pilot, Chromebooks and Canvas did not play well. Now you can use a Chromebook and it's just fine. So you know there are cheaper technology options than were available at the start of the pilot five years ago. And in your books, we do have a list of the technology specifications for Canvas. And you can't click on the link, so I'm going to click to the next screen. <laughs> and so for the screen size, they recommend a 1024 by 600 screen size. Again, you can use it on an app on a phone, but that's just Canvas's, what, if you go to Canvas and what's recommended to run Canvas, that is what is recommended. Uh, Windows 7, Windows 10, Mac OS are fine, and also Chrome now. You have apps for um, Apple and Android. For the computer speed, they're saying nothing older than five years. So if you have some dinosaur computers laying around or dinosaur laptops, it's not to say it wouldn't work, but it probably would not work 
as well. Uh, internet speed, they also say no dial-up. Uh, when we were in Chicago, I kind of cracked that joke that who has dial-up and one of the folks from back east in a more rural area said, actually, that's the only way we can get internet. So I don't know how it would work with dial-up, but they do recommend high-speed connections. And then just to point out that um, Canvas is voiceover and um, JAWS friendly, and the online curriculum um, was built by our instructional designer, who's also the state board's ac accessibility expert. And so it was built in the HTML, and it is accessible, if anyone had questions about that. So getting back to this whole internet access. In the pilot project, the Gates Foundation, part of the funding provided to the colleges who participated money for laptops and hotspots. It was a nicety. It's not necessarily a necessity. Um, we're finding more and more of the students do have access points or they have unlimited mobile plans and they're running their hotspot off their phone. But as we've been surveying students, we're finding more and more. That's not to say we don't have pockets who have limited access. But for the most part, we're finding <coughs> that the students do have access. When students don't have access, like Adria pointed out this morning, you can brainstorm with the students where there's Wi-Fi in the community or where there's campus access points where students can go to get that. In one case, um, we had to really think outside the box, and one of our colleges actually had dishes installed at students' houses, and somehow the bills were subsidized because there was no wireless aspect at that point in the project. Um, so again, post-pilot, we're not really offering access. We're giving students lists of access points. We did find out that um, Title II funds can be used. We have an email from Octay verifying that if you do need to provide hotspots to students, as long as they're part of an instructional package, you can purchase that with a laptop. So you could put a bag, laptop, hotspot, headset, mouse, check it out to the student as an instructional package and check it back in. And then in some cases, college foundations or other foundations or other businesses might be able to help provide those Wi-Fi hotspots if you were still in need of them. So that brings me to how do you check out the computers? <coughs> That's something you want to think about before you start with this. It might be, hey, can we start tomorrow? Sure. But if you're going to be checking computers out, if you're doing web enhanced idea, this really won't apply. But if you're thinking of doing a flipped version and you're going to give students technology to take home and not require them to have their own technology, you really want to spend time kind of thinking this process out. Um, and if you're buying computers that might be checked out, you probably want to work through your IT department. Um, in Washington, for the most part, librarians, the library, help check these out because they could actually put a hold on accounts. Um, they have been checked out through IT departments. They have been checked out of the basic skills director's office. Um, so it kind of depended on each campus situation, but I would say probably 80% of the time they've gone through the libraries as a package with the laptop, the mouse, the headset, everything being checked out. What paperwork is going to be required? Do you have an acceptable use form? What things need to be signed in order to check that out? What are you going to tell the students about the repercussions? I can tell you if you're nervous about possibly lending technology to students. I think we've only lost six in six years. So that's not bad when you think about 25 students per quarter per 34 providers. That's not a lot of computers that have gone disappearing. And in some cases, we've thought they've disappeared and the student just took a detour, had to go home for a while. And when they came back, they did bring the laptops back to campus. We do have some examples. And I'll show you when I pop out to Canvas. It's in the director's module. But we do have some examples of marketing forms for um, students. And we also have some examples of use forms that were modified to be used with um, IDEA students for the checkout. So this is the part you've all been waiting for. How do I find this stuff? 
So I'm going to show you a couple slides. I'm going to ask you to be patient, and then I'm going to pop out to Canvas and do a show and tell with everyone. So the next slide, if you're a Canvas user, here's a quick side-by-side -side that you can look at and go back to refer to. I'm actually going to do a show and tell. If you're a non-Canvas user, if you're using Blackboard, Angel, D2L, Moodle, they are supposed to take the Canvas export file, which is called an IMSCC file. It's just what comes down. When you download a Canvas cartridge, don't try to open it on your computer because you'll get program not found. It's basically just to sit in your downloads folder until somebody comes and tries to pull it into something else. If you try to search for a program to open it, your computer's going to go crazy and it's just going to keep spinning because there is nothing to open it except another learning management system. So if you do download a cartridge, if you do try to import this into something else, you want to work with your IT or e-learning folks to make sure that everything's coming across as it should. And you probably do want to open it in the free Canvas account that you now all have access to. So you can see a side-by-side -side comparison of this is what it looks like in Canvas. This is what it looks like in my LMS. These are things that might not have imported correctly, or these are things that we need to fix. We can help a little bit in troubleshooting at the state board. Our e-learning department's been great when folks have tried to use another LMS. but you do want to try to work through your campus folks, and then if you're running into glitches, I'm happy to pass those questions on to our e-learning team. If you don't have an LMS at all, please don't panic. You all do now because you all have access to this free Canvas account, which gives you a Canvas account. So if you don't have an LMS at all, you now do have an LMS on the free Canvas. There are limitations for free Canvas versus the paid Canvas account in the sense that we can change our storage in state. On the free Canvas, you get 250 megabytes. Um, you know, in Washington, our e-learning departments batch upload our students to the course. If you're using the free Canvas, you need to upload your own students to the course, things like that. So, you know, there are some limitations, but you all do have free Canvas that you could use to get started or at least go explore the curriculum further as you're trying to get the backing to possibly start this course. And if for non-Canvas users, I also put a slide in the presentation that you can go refer to that's a quick side-by-side how-to, but I have better directions for you in your conference program starting on page 126. And those have screenshots and more detailed step-by-step -step directions. So we're going to pause here. If you do not have your laptops out, now would be a wonderful time to get your laptops out. And I'm going to take you through how to do this step-by-step. I will ask, and our team will be circulating, but I do ask that you wait for the directions and go step by step because there are some things that if you kind of skip a step, it'll make more work for you in the back end. So as you get your computers out, please go ahead and log into canvas.instructure.com. It's the free Canvas course, um, or the free site for Canvas. And then I'll start giving you your directions. If you don't remember where that site is, raise your hand and wave, and somebody from our team will come run over and help you get there. <coughs> So at some point, everyone should be on what looks like this Canvas dashboard and just stay there. You don't need to go into the training course. Just stay on the main dashboard with the colored boxes. I have a lot more boxes. You should only have one. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah.
So hopefully everyone is in Canvas by now and you're looking at your dashboard. From your dashboard, I need you to scroll down and depending on your view, you're going to either see start a new course over on the right side of your screen or you may see start a new course on the bottom of your screen. So everybody please locate where it says start a new course and go ahead and click that button. We all good? Okay, so this is where you would this is where we would name the course. So you can name it anything you want, Seattle test, idea test, whatever you would like to name it, but please pause there once you name it. Okay, so once you've named your course, there's one more step I need you to take. Where it says content license, please use the drop down menu and select CC attribution, the first option under Creative Commons licenses. The reason we're asking you to do this is that is the license that this was released under and we ask that when you use the curricula, you keep the same license. and then go ahead and click Create Course. Once you've created your course, your screen should look like what you see on our monitors. You will just see home discussions, grades, people, and then you'll have a blank screen that says Create a New Module. Um, trainers, is everyone there, or do we need a couple minutes? Okay, thank you. <laughs> One of those updates being installed. Okay, so what we're going to do here, now that you've started a course, you can either go over on the right-hand side of your screen and you'll see Import from Commons, or you can go click on the left part of your screen where you see the C with the arrow in it for Commons. You're going to want to click on one of those options and it's going to bring you to the Canvas Commons search screen. There are a couple ways to find IDEA we found. One is you can search IDEA and you have to do caps with a hyphen between the I and the D. Or we have found that the curricula sometimes comes up faster if you search by my last name. Either option works. So you can either search IDEA, capital I, hyphen, capital D-E-A, or you can search under RUBAC, R-U-B-A-C-K. Are you? Yes, that's what we just did. No, but you're creating it. You're, you're going to create it with the idea. This is this is a blank shell, and we're going to import it from Commons. If you're copying an old course, that's where it gets messy. Hopefully you're all kind of in this search thing and coming up with something on your search, search screen that looks like these pictures with idea. So 
it ends up in different places depending on how you search. But the first thing I need you to look for is something called the idea course template. So as you scroll through these images, look at the blue hyperlinks and you want to find the idea course template. And if that, does, if that does not work, try adding course to your search. And the view is different for everyone, so no one's screen's going to match mine exactly. But once you find this course template, I want to make sure everyone's there before I give any more directions. Danica, we okay over there? Okay. Good. Okay, so please go ahead and click on the blue hyperlink and it's going to open up a window that looks like this. Click, please. Yes. Okay. Um, I will tell you, as you get more courses in Canvas, when you're searching on Commons, frequently if an update has happened, you'll get a box like this that says, show courses or update your courses with the latest version. Be very careful because sometimes you might want that latest version in one course only. If you click it apply to all, you may inadvertently get things in your other courses that you don't need that you then need to go delete. And there is no like, you know, control Z for undo in Canvas. So what you'll do now is you're going to go ahead and scroll through your list. Your list, if you, this is your first time on free Canvas, will be very small. My list is a little bit longer, but scroll through and find your test course that you just created and check the box. If you only have one course and it says all, don't worry about it. If you have multiple courses and it says all, you don't want that. But if you have one course and it's all, you're good. Once you're there and you've got your box checked, go ahead and click Import into Canvas. And you'll get a green bar across the top of your screen that says you've successfully started the import. At this point, it might help if you create duplicate tabs because you're going to be toggling back and forth a lot. So if you're comfortable working in multiple tabs, you might want to duplicate this tab. It takes a couple minutes to work. Once, give it a couple minutes and then click back and go back to your dashboard. And that would be found in the left hand bar of your screen. And then you're going to want to scroll through and find your course. and you're gonna to want to open your course. I think you'll be okay. I think you'll be okay. Okay. 
Okay, so once you click back over to your dashboard, you should notice that that screen no longer says create a module. You should all see this idea image in your course now. If you went back to the test course you created. If you're in your test course and you do not see the idea homepage image, please raise your hand and somebody will come over and help you. <coughs> What this is, is there is absolutely no content in here. So please don't start clicking and round and going, well, where's the stuff? The only things that come over with this course template are the idea homepage, which it's open resource, so you're welcome to change this. The syllabus comes over. So we have a syllabus built that you can go through and edit for your programs. And we'll talk about the syllabus again in a couple minutes. And it also imports the grading scheme, which will help you with calculating distance hours if you're doing a flipped classroom. The other surprise that will be there for you that's not showing is there is a module that is unpublished. Don't publish this. This is for instructors only. It just gives you a little information that you will need to know and a link to all of the instructor resources that are also available in your program book. But the students don't need to see this. So it gets brought over, but you can leave it there unpublished. Don't worry about the students seeing it. The only way they will is if you hit the button to publish this. So, does everyone have a course template in their shells now? We all good? Okay. Now, we're going to pop back over to Commons. So, if you have two tabs open, you can toggle between. If you don't have two tabs over, then please go ahead and click on the Commons logo and access it that way. If you are toggling, you're going to want to hit back. If you're not toggling, you will just end up at the screen. So the next thing I want you to go ahead and import is, uh, does anyone want the tech skills assessments? Okay. So, well, mine came up, but you can actually search idea technology skills pre-assessment or just IDEA or RUBAC, however you would like to get there, and find the technology skills pre-assessment due in class. Okay. And then please stop because there are a couple steps that you need to do. Don't just say, oh, I know how to import and just start grabbing modules. You will not like it in a few minutes and I'll show you why. Okay, so once you have this, uh, are we all ready on my left side of the room? Okay. Will, can you give me a thumbs up when we're ready? Okay. Okay, so it looks like most of us are there. If you're not, we'll help you get caught up. Go ahead and click on the link again, and it's going to bring up the same screen you had before. Again, you're going to want to find your course that you just created. Click on the box and hit Import into Canvas. 
let it work for a couple minutes. And then if you're toggling, you can just pop back over to your course. And if you refresh your screen, you now should see an additional module besides the one that was unpublished. Okay, so once you get to this step, please don't say, I'm going to go bring in more. Take a pause and click on assignments. So when you're back in your Canvas course and you see the tech skills pre-assessment show up, and this is really, really important if you are doing a fully flipped class, whether it be tailored or full idea. Okay. So if you're there, please wait for a second. Okay, so I think we're all good to go now. Adria? Okay. Okay, so this is the one thing, and I'm showing you how to bring in module by module just because most of you raised your hand and said tailored idea. And so you would never want to bring in the full course because you're going to have to go and publish and do a lot of deleting. So I'm showing you how to bring in a module by module view. So as you're bringing in your modules, Every time you bring in a module, I really need you to get used to stopping and pausing and doing this step. Once the module's in, you need to click on your Assignments tab. And if you notice, it's going to say Imported Assignments. If it was Web Enhanced, it wouldn't be such a big deal. But if you're fully flipping and it's just a good habit to get into, you need to rename the module every single time. Otherwise, everything will end up in an imported assignments module, and then you will literally have to go drag and drop and move things around. It's a little bit easier than it used to be, but if you have eight modules worth of stuff that you need to sort out, it's probably easier if you just get used to pausing and doing this step. To do this, just simply click on the, three, um, the line of the three dots and click Edit, and then you just type the correct name. Now, because this is done in class, even if you are doing a fully flipped version of the course, you'd still be weighting this at zero, so you can go ahead and put a zero weight in here because it's done in class, and then click Save. Okay. Yes, because it's done in class. And if it helps, right now we're on page 130 in your conference program. So if you're trying to follow along, um, you can also start looking at 130. And we're going to repeat this step a couple times from page 130 on. Okay. Has everyone managed to rename everyone managed to rename their modules? Okay, if you need help, raise your hand, or if someone needs help, please, and you're sitting next to them and done, please assist them.
I feel like we need some music or something for the commercial breaks. No, that's him, not me. Will's the singer. Okay, can I get a thumbs up or, a, okay, we're ready to move on. So we're going to go back again either to comments from this screen or if you're working with two tabs, just go back to comments, click the back button, and just to kind of go in sequence, let's find the introduction to idea module. So again, we're going back to Canvas Commons and we're searching for introduction to idea. And if you just type idea introduction, it should pop up pretty quickly. Intro to idea. Once you're there, go ahead and click on that blue hyperlink and go through the import process again. So you're going to find your course, check the box, and import. Has everyone gotten this far to importing the introduction to idea module? Okay. Um, if you click back over to your course and refresh, you'll know when it shows up because the module will pop. But make sure if you're toggling between tabs that you do refresh your screen because it doesn't automatically refresh for you. So again, it will show in your modules view, but you need to do that step. So once everybody sees it in their modules view, please do not forget to click on assignments and rename the imported assignment group to introduction to idea. So with waiting introduction to idea, um, if you're waiting this course, if you're doing web enhanced, you can just still make it a zero. If you were doing tailored idea flipped, you'd have to figure out how to wait it depending on how many weeks your quarter was. For now, I'm just going to put 10% figuring we're doing maybe full idea and flipped. You can always adjust the assignment group weights later. So don't worry about that as long as you get in the habit of weighting them. Once you click save, we're going to pause for a minute while everyone gets caught up. That's 
I'll ignore you. Okay. Um, are we all in a place where we've renamed Intro to Idea in your assignment groups? And the one thing that you might be noticing now is that on your screens, some things are a darker gray and some items are a lighter gray. All that means is that the students, when they go into student view, will see the dark gray sections only. The light gray sections are your instructor's view. And we, when we developed the course, decided to always have the students go through modules. That way they wouldn't click on assignments and randomly maybe pick something we had not taught yet or randomly find a discussion board that was on a topic we hadn't gotten to yet. So for the students and student view, they always be going through the modules view. The light gray tabs are what you can see as your instructor view. Okay, so I just need a show of hands. We all good with introduction to idea? Okay, so from here on out, you can pick your own module to import. The difference is I am no longer going to give you the step-by-step -step instructions. So what I would like you to do is go to Canvas, find an idea module, import it on your own and do all of the steps and we're going to do that twice just to make sure everyone's getting that one thing that you're not supposed to forget to do. Um, and if you need help with module names on page 45 through 49 of your program is the scope and sequence that has all of the modules for IDEA listed. So please go ahead and find your own module for IDEA and go ahead and import it into the class. So everyone has either um, found another module or at this point is ready to move on. So I want to show you a few more things here in Canvas that you need to know about. The first thing I need you to take a look at is the syllabus. We're all going to be on in your Canvas course, not on Canvas Commons. And go ahead and just click on the syllabus for a second. I want to show you a couple things. I did a quick scroll through before. So this top portion you'll eventually delete out. But there's a note here that says replace the red text with your information. Um, 
I will say that in the past five years, I've occasionally found a syllabus that still has the red text in it. And um, students actually do look at these. So please keep in mind that the syllabus is here and needs to be edited. I recommend leaving it in, especially if you're doing any form of flipped or distance hours because the syllabus should be attached to the mechanism that we're counting the hours out of. So being built into Canvas, Canvas generating the hours, this is where it is. To edit the syllabus, it's really easy. There's an edit button at the top. Some of the things that are in the syllabus may or may not apply to your programs, depending what state you're in. So you can always, or if you're not funded in Washington and you're doing this on your own um, from another entity. So you may need to do a little tweaking. The syllabus, you know, instructor information, how to log into Canvas, your contact information, if you have a tech coach, their contact information, your outcomes, the modules you would cover, supplies needed for class, any of your um, class rules, browser information, tech requirements, online communication, help and resources. Again, if you don't have all of these help and resources available, you I'm going to need to edit them out, but this is built for Washington. And then this grading thing. By grading, we don't necessarily mean ABC. Generally, courses are pass-fail. However, grading also incorporates your attendance hours. If you are doing a fully flipped course, whether it be tailored or full idea, this chart needs to be edited to reflect the number of hours you're offering. So if you're doing nine and nine, you're good to go. It's already here. If you're doing anything else, you're going to need to do some tweaking of how you're going to assign contact hours. In some states that we've been in, they wanted to go 91 to 100, 81 to 90, 71 you know, to 80, et cetera. That is perfectly fine, but you need to adjust this chart and adjust your hours. This is, again, how we're doing it in Washington for full idea. When you get to this point, I am more than happy to sit and walk through this portion of the syllabus with you. I'm happy to help you with adjusting your contact hours. My business cards are on every table here, so feel free to grab them, and you are welcome to call me when you get to that point. I don't want to go through it now because there's probably too many different case scenarios, but I just wanted to point out that the syllabus is something you will need to edit for contact hours. Pardon me, Jody. Just a brief clarification. You don't want to bring in any modules that are not idea modules. That'll really jack things up. Okay, there are a couple other things that I need to point out to you. So again, please keep in mind you have a syllabus. There's a lot of stuff that says insert your information there. Please keep in mind that you can tweak it, but please do not leave it with insert teacher name. Students do find this or their children or someone will find this and wonder what we're doing. If you're editing your grading scheme or assigning hours differently, you're also going to want to edit that portion. Okay, a couple more things I need to show you.
Sorry, I'm grabbing an extra module so I can demo something for you. Canvas is just glitchy at some points. OK, so since I'm back at Commons, I'm going to show you what's on Commons and then kind of flip back over to the Canvas course. I got a little out of order here because I realized I didn't have something to show one portion. So in Commons, or in your scope and sequence, you probably all noticed a Washington State history course. And if you're in Washington, you're like, yeah, that's great. If you're from Kansas or California or Oregon, you're probably going, why do we have Washington State history and idea? Well, I could say cuz, like my daughter, but I am going to say that we have built, and watch me have to scroll forever to find this, um, <clears throat> there is a blank history template in here as I keep scrolling and scrolling. <laughs> Here, it's called State History Template Module. So basically what that is, is Washington State History with Washington's information pulled out. So you have blank templates that you can fill in and create your own state's history module. So you can use the Washington one as a guide but there is a blank template. Or you could just say, you know what? We're not doing our state history. We're not doing Washington state history. And we're going to forget that module exists. That is also your prerogative in the open source curricula. But if you do want to create your own state history module, we have a template in there for you. So I did want to point that out because occasionally I do have that question arise. <coughs> Okay, a couple more things. We're going to click back to our Canvas course now. Okay, so the other thing I want to show you, <coughs> excuse me, is in the assignment uh, section. Go back to your assignments for a minute. And I have an assignment group I need to rename real quickly. But I want you to notice on my screen and your screens again are going to look a little bit different. I want you to find in parentheses where it says due in class. And I'm going to explain what that is in the assignment title. So I had brought in the health and wellness module, and I have read, listen, do, record, doctor and patient, do in class. If you have study skills, you'll have a different do in class, time management, et cetera. But usually, for every module, you might see one do in class assignment. If it's introduction to idea that says do in class, leave it. But any other module besides introduction to idea, if you see this due in class, and again, this is especially important if you are doing distance ed hours, you need to create one more assignment group and move these due in class assignments into that group. So to create an assignment group, um, you can cheat in this thing that says assignments here. You can just rename it to due in class. Or you can go ahead and click on the plus group and create an assignment group. Because you cannot count due in class assignments for distance education hours because there is no separation between teacher and student. So we need to get those hours out of the count. If you're doing web enhanced, it won't matter. But if you're assigning any type of distance ed hour for this class, you need to get your due in class assignments moved into that category. Yeah. 
Yes, because the students demo in class and then we send them home to repeat. So the students are still getting some work outside of class. And it's your choice. You could also just not count any of that, but because it is built in to go home and redo in practice, we do allow that. So if you just label that due in class, you do not want to weight this. This is one assignment group that has zero weight. Click Save and then move any of your due in class assignments into that group. It's really easy to move them. So I'm going to pause and make sure everyone has a due in class group and then I'll show you how to move these up. And again, your due in class assignments are not necessarily going to look with the same name as mine, depending on what you imported. Okay, so to move a due in class assignment up, if you click on the dots on the side of the screen, you'll see a move to button. If you just go ahead and click move to, you can just choose your assignment group do in class, click move, and lo and behold, it moves it down without you having to drag, which was the old way we did this. Okay. And again, the reason we're moving do in class to do in class is for distance at hours you can't report distance ed for anything that is done in the presence of a teacher. If you're running a web enhanced version, then you are good to go. But if you're counting distance, this step must be done. Are we all good here with the do in class? Any other questions about why we're moving them around, etc.? Okay, so I'm going to move on and show you the one other thing that you need to know once I have everyone's attention. Okay, so click on settings. So again, you're in your course and it's one of the bars. So you're going to want to click on settings. And a couple things I wanted to point out in the settings tab. First, if you go over to navigation, this is where you can pick and choose what you want students to see. Again, we have it set so everyone goes through the modules view so no one is willy-nilly clicking on some place we might not want them to be yet. And we're finding that that works. Again, it's your prerogative if you're adopting it elsewhere to have other navigation features. But it seems to be pretty concrete if students access three modules, they just get in the habit and then they're not randomly accessing assignments. Um, the other thing I want you to do is click on the course details tab. And if you scroll down the course details tab, which is your first tab, and you go about halfway down the page, you should see something that says enable course grading scheme. And with the enable course grading scheme, this is where you adjust how the course will calculate your distance ed hours if you're doing 
any type of distance at assignment. Okay, so once you're here, if you click on the view grading scheme, this is again set for full idea, nine hours online, nine hours face to face. If you're doing anything different or you're doing five and five, six and six, you're going to need to go in and adjust this chart. You can make your own or you can just edit this one if you want to get my more minute in detail. If you're in Washington, we're keeping kind of this scale. You can just adjust your hours so everybody is kind of doing the same range. If you're in another state and you need to get more minute in detail, then you, know, you can go ahead and either edit this one or create a new one. To edit, it's very simple. You just click the pencil icon and if, say, you were doing uh, five and five. You would just simply change the 90 to 50 and then break your scale down from there. If you were doing 60, break your scale down from there. But you want to make sure that this mimics the number of distance ed hours you will offer. Again, if you're doing web enhanced, you can just uncheck the button and you never have to worry about the grading scheme. But if you are assigning distance at hours, you need to have the grading scheme enabled. And again, the grading scheme is about halfway down this page. And you want to make sure that box is checked. If you're doing web enhance, the box does not need to be checked. And then you want to make sure you adjust this grading scheme to meet the number of hours your program is awarding. Please keep in mind that this is set for 90, 90 9 and 9. You do not ever want to over-report your distance at hours. Most data collection systems will you know, do the eh, wrong answer. You're over-reporting your hours. Some don't tell you that. And if you get audited or monitored here in Washington or in your state, somebody's going to call you on over-reporting distance at hours. So it's very important that you edit this grading scheme. Again, when you get to that point that you're ready to adopt this, I know this is kind of like yesterday morning getting hit with a fire hose. <laughs> You've got my email, you have my phone number, the directions are in here. I'm happy to walk through it with you. I just don't want anybody to end up getting audited or monitored and getting dinged for having too many hours, which can easily happen. So this kind of gets us back to idea using this learner mastery model. And what I want to show you is kind of what the grade book looks like, but obviously not with real student data. So I'm just going to randomly grab something in a training course. I'm just gonna grab one of the other training courses for a minute. In your grading tab, <coughs> so it will give you every, so there's a lot of columns. I will preface this by saying there are a lot of columns in the idea grade book. And it just scrolls and scrolls and scrolls. So as you work in the grade book, there's a couple things you need to be aware of. And pardon the scrolling, I'm trying to go, so first, any of these gray columns are the columns that are your whole module total. So if you're assigning distance at hours by the week, you're gonna wanna look at the gray columns towards the end of your grade book to figure out how many hours you're assigning to students per week for distance ed purposes. These hours will go up and down, and I believe that we've talked about this a couple times, but they can fluctuate. That's the beauty of idea. A student might only get two hours, and maybe the next week they might get five hours, and all of a sudden they're like, hey, I know how to do these activities. I'm gonna go back and finish the activities I've been doing. So 
you want to warn your data entry folks that the hours that you're reporting for distance, depending on how often you have to report, may fluctuate. And it's OK. We don't want you to lock the modules after one week. We want to give the students the opportunity to go back. That's the whole point of learner mastery. They're learning at their own pace, and they're mastering the content at their own pace. But if folks get a little nervous and say, oh my god, what if we're over-reporting the hours, or how do I know? Well, at the end of the quarter, that's where you'll get your double check, because Canvas will show you their whole average, and it will show you the number of hours that a student earned. Keep in mind that this is a training course, so uh, there's a lot of zero hours, because it was a training that we did similar to this one today. But there's one thing I do want to point out. When you get ready to calculate hours, you need to click on this gear cog, and you need to make sure that you hit treat on graded as zero. If you do not hit treat on graded as zero, you could potentially have one student who did one assignment and got 100%, and they would be getting nine hours for that module. You could have another student who did 12 assignments and maybe got a 70%, and they'd be getting less hours for the module. I cannot stress how important if you're assigning, if it's web enhanced, again, you probably want to let the students know that what they've actually earned. And if you have to assign a pass fail, you probably want to hit the treat ungraded as zero. But it is so important for assigning distance at hours that you hit this treat ungraded as zero button. That way, the student who did one assignment and got 100, the other assignments affect their average, and you're not over assigning or giving students credits for hours they did not earn. I usually, at the start of a quarter, I personally just keep treat ungraded as zero checked for the whole time. If you're going to click on and off of it, you need to make sure as you click on and off of it, that when you're pulling hours and reporting your hours, that you've checked this button. If you don't, you'll be over-reporting your distance at hours. Any questions on that lecture? <laughs> Sorry, distance ed is one of the other things that falls under me at the state board, so I just really want to make sure folks are doing that correctly. So this is it in a nutshell. Everything you need to do to import course templates, import modules, set up your gradebook, et cetera. Everything is covered and setting up your class in Canvas starting on page 126. You have step-by-step -step screenshots. Again, I am happy to walk you through it when you get to the point of it adoption. You can call me. We're happy to do webinars. This will be up on the web to look at. So in the course, the training course will be accessible to you. But I didn't want anyone just to walk out and not have this information. So we're going to click back over to our PowerPoint. Okay. So we are also very fortunate to have um, training, other training opportunities that we can offer you. A couple of things that we're looking for um, with IDEA is similar to what Will does with iBEST, is we will have a menu of services available where we can either go out to a program and bring a small team to train, or maybe if there's several programs in your state who are interested in getting started with IDEA, you can um, pool your resources and have a team come. We're also able to do some web-based trainings um, as part of this menu of services, where if folks need a web-based training, and we're also looking at the possibility of having an asynchronous training for IDEA. But in addition to those training opportunities, which you would contact me about, we also have other opportunities through the state board. 
And so I want to show you what we have to offer. And I'm going to click back over to the training course. So in the training course, if I can click on the right button, there is also a module called uh, Canvas Information. It's just under the Getting Started module. And SBCTC's e-learning department is happy to provide, well, in-state, they're happy to provide all the time and send us messages on it. Um, for out-of-state attendees who've attended an IDEA conference, um, you also can have access to our Canvas 101 training, our accessibility training, and open educational resources trainings. So it is um, something that you can all access should you wish to. And so under in the Canvas info module under the on the page that says Canvas Accessibility and Open Educational Resource Training Opportunities, if you open that up, it gives you very specific instructions that our office requests that you follow. So there's a spreadsheet here, and you download the spreadsheet. And again, for Washingtonians, this does not apply to you, but other states, you would download the spreadsheet. You're going to open it up, and you're going to fill it out. So the t title of the course you wish to enroll in, first name, last name, and your email address. You're going to save this file, and then you're going to go ahead and email it to Shannon Bell at our office. Once Shannon receives it, she will put you on a list for entry into one of the courses. Some of the courses we have dates that will immediately be available, others um, are still to be announced. And you can find dates and always check back on when courses might be available by clicking the training registration link. Washington staff gets first dibs at the trainings if there's space available. Once you're on that waiting list, Shannon will let you know when the course is available for you to take. These are all online asynchronous trainings, does not require any travel on your part. You can just log in. They're all hosted in Canvas. And so right now we have Canvas 101 dates in July and August. The accessibility and OER trainings will be announced later, but again, you can get those dates by clicking on that link. If you had to do any training to get started with IDEA, I would start with Canvas 101 first. That will help you manipulate Canvas, make sure, and it goes over a lot of what we've talked about, but it's a, more in-depth than we can offer you in a couple days going through the curricula. OER and Accessibility 101, if you ever have any plans to tweak this curricula or if you're going to start adding your own things, and again, I would have to say I would offer it as is the first two to three times and not really say, oh, I need to add this and I need to add this. That's great to think about down the road, but just as you're getting used to the format, you're getting your students used to the format, and a lot of instructors would say, oh, there's, you know, there's not enough. I need to add things. Most of the instructors, as we were having our pilot meetings, were coming back and saying, I didn't get through everything in this module, either because of a holiday or something going on in campus or something organically kind of expanded. And again, all the time frames are based on our best estimates. So in some classes, it may have taken 20 minutes. In others, it may have taken 45. But I would really hold off tweaking and adding your own spin to it until you're kind of used to the format. Once you get to the point where you might want to bring in your own page or you might want to add to the page or you might want to add a couple, either add to an existing a Google Doc or maybe make more Google Docs, that's when this OER and accessibility training will come in because we worked with a wonderful librarian from Wenatchee Valley College, and she made sure that 
everything was properly attributed, that we had permission letters filed, that we have everything. And there's that clearinghouse that we kind of said during the training, you don't really need this, but it's everything that keeps us legal. If you're going to start changing these pages, then that piece kind of goes on to you to make sure that you're also using open resources and using it properly. When you get to that point, you probably do want that open resources training. And the same with accessibility. As you're adding things and tweaking things, we've made it accessible. Once you start adding and doing things to it, then the accessibility responsibility kind of moves to you. And that's when you would want some accessibility training, whether it's offered in your state, at your agency, on your campus, or if it isn't offered, we're able to provide that for you. But if I had to pick one to do right away, Canvas 101 would be it. Okay. I will also be publishing a page uh, shortly. Um, I'm working on how to attribute the course because that's a question I've been getting a lot. So I'll be adding a page to this module that actually tells you if you're using Canvas how to give us credit because one of the things we ask for is that you give us credit, it's free to use. So I'll be adding a page that shows you how to give credit for different aspects of the course. Now what? Oh, I'm supposed to tell you. Oh, I see. So we've provided you with a lot of information just now and over the past couple days. So to summarize the main points of the session, when you return to your campus or your institution, you want to share what you learned with your director or, and or colleagues, determine how you might implement the curriculum, begin planning, make campus and other connections, and investigate technology. And now would be your chance to ask any last minute questions before we dismiss. So is anything pressing that has not been asked that you really want to know? You have a captive audience right now, so. Okay. Um, we will be looking at the Google Doc and we will be responding to questions that were placed in there. Um, after you leave and you start digesting and start talking about this, feel free to pop questions in there or email them directly to me. And I'm happy to, um, we'll keep monitoring that and answering them. Again, if you have corrections, specific questions, please type them in the corrections document so we can move them on. Will, there's a question over there you want to run down? I'm from the state of Oregon, and I'm wondering what you foresee or hope will happen um, at the state level to, to perpetuate this or to, to get states to train faculty and keep mm -hmm. it going. Well, we've done four of the national trainings already. This will officially be the last national kind of bring groups together. We're happy to come into states. I would say share the information with programs. If you have a statewide conference, we're happy to maybe do a presentation session at a conference. Um, we're happy to share information. I know a few uh, Lane Community College has already done a bunch of training on ideas, so you know they would be good resources to share maybe with the rest of the state. But it's more sharing, getting the word out, letting folks know the curricula is there. We're happy to do in-person in training. Um, you know, just letting folks know the resources is there. Some states have an approved resource list, which I was not aware of that. You have to have your distance ed curricula placed on a list and be approved in order to do this. 
So if your state has an approved list of distance ed curricula, getting us on the approved list would be wonderful. Um, you know, just depending on what the state policies are, some it had to go in in the RFP, which is a different process also. So whatever you can do to get the word out, and then if you need us to do a presentation or come do a training, et cetera, just get in touch with me. My cards are on the table. You're welcome to email Will, but he will forward the question to me. So <laughs> if you need IBES training, talk to Will, though. Anyone else with last minute questions? Okay, Will? Just means there's one thing left. Thank you. Thanks for a great conference. Thanks for sticking it out. Thanks for all of the work that you did in the focus sessions. I'd like to get one last round of applause for the faculty trainers for their work with you. And then a final acknowledgement for Jody for all the work that she's done on this project. And then for those, those remaining, those in Washington State who were part of the pilots and then moving in to um, adopt an idea on their campuses, thank you for the work that you've done on there, really. And then for all of our, all of our guests from other states, other areas, thanks so much for being here. It was a real pleasure. And we look forward to supporting you and working with you in any way that we can moving forward. To, you're welcome to go, but Will and I will be around for a few minutes and as we start trickling out. Um, so if you have questions or need to chat with us, we're welcome to answer them. But otherwise, safe travels, everyone. <laughs>